These are my feet, each one of them consisting of 26 bones, 30 joints, and more than 100 muscles. And if your feet look anything like this, then we'll need to zoom out. Because chances are what's happening downstream is a byproduct of something much larger happening. One of the most important facets to look at when fixing duck feet is the relationship between how the hip, knee, and ankle all work with one another. A lot of the time when we're dealing with duck feet or these externally rotated tibias, we have to look at what the femur is doing and the orientation of the femur. More often than not, if the tibia is externally rotated, placing my foot in more to this pronated position, the more the femur itself is gonna roll into a internal rotation. Now, as we start to look upstream, we can start to understand why the femur will bias this internal rotation, really as a result of what our hips are doing. You see, if my my pelvis is more in this anteriorly tilted or excess of lordotic position, that is going to anatomically push my femurs into more of an internally rotated state. The more my femurs roll into an internally rotated position, the more it's going to push my tibias into an external rotation, and the more it's going to bias that pronation of the foot, perpetuating this duck foot syndrome throughout our body. And the reason for this is our body is always looking for some level of neutrality. So typically when a joint moves into one extreme range of motion, our body has to counteract that in some way to try to find some sense of balance. Now we're not gonna get into all the nitty gritty details today. I don't wanna overcomplicate you with all the details, but I want to give you some level of understanding so that way when we get into the exercises, you understand how these different components work with one another. So without further ado, let's get into said exercises. So for this first technique, we're gonna work through a pigeon toe hinge. And the reason why we're doing that is we wanna to start to give the body some level of understanding how to find a different placement of weight through the feet. And then how can we create stability from the feet up into the hips from the ground? So if I'm in this duck foot orientation, like so, then chances are I tend to put too much weight on this inside edge of my foot. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna roll the feet in like so. And then we're gonna think about just splaying the ground out slightly. And that's just gonna allow you to find a little bit more weight on the outer edge of the feet. Now when we're here, we just wanna be mindful of the knees and not allowing the knees to go into this knee valgus or knock knee position. So we'll just wanna splay them out alongside the ground tension. And then what we'll do from here is keeping the ground tension splayed out is we're just gonna to begin to find a hinge. So I'm gonna think about my knees staying where they are in, are in space. I'm gonna to begin to sit the hips back and you'll probably feel some of the hamstring and glute fibers begin to come online. And once you have that, we're just gonna maintain it as we slowly start to stand up into more of this upright position. Keeping the weight to the outer edge of the feet, I'll sit that back and you may even find as you're going through this that you get a little bit of a stretch through the tissues right here. And the reason for that is these tissues, when we're in this duck footed position, tend to get quite bound up and restricted. So by going more into this pigeon toe position, we're gonna be stretching out all those fibers that tend to get a little bit more restricted when we're in that duck foot orientation. So now that we understand this hip orientation with the pigeon toe, we have some length through those fibers. You're gonna grab yourself some broomsticks, dowels, wizard staffs, whatever you wanna call them. We're gonna work through some single leg work. And these are meant to act more as a last case scenario to create some balance for us but I want you to primarily be using your standing leg. So in this case, it's gonna be my left foot. I'm gonna point my toes straight towards you. I'm not gonna allow myself to fall into that overpronated position or this external, externally rotated tibial position. We're gonna have everything pointed towards you. And what I'm gonna think with this bone right here is I'm gonna to try to turn it in this way. So I'm kind of trying to almost like squash a bug or something right underneath my foot here. Now, once I have kind of that squashing sensation, what we're gonna do is sit our hips back this way. So we're finding that same sort of hinge position. I can feel the similar fibers kind of through the hamstring, maybe even some calf and glute here as well come online. And then what we're gonna do is keeping the foot pointed towards you, using that sensation through the back leg. I'm gonna slowly roll weight forward and I'm gonna to begin to lift that heel off the ground. So I'm almost doing like a calf raise as this knee comes up. Then I'm gonna let the leg come back and I'm gonna reground myself back into that hip. So we're getting more oriented into that sensation of hip stability on that left side. And then we're starting to use that 
to take us through a particular range of motion. What this is gonna allow for is give our body the understanding of where we want tension to reside in our body, and then how can we use that tension to take us through a particular range of motion. The more familiar our body gets with going through these types of sensations, the more likely it is to use those sensations on a day-to-day -day basis. Speaking of a day-to-day -day basis, something that we could be mindful of when we're trying to address our duck feet is how we walk throughout the course of the day. When was the last time that you just looked down at your feet, you saw where your feet were in space, and you just changed the orientation of them when you were going through a walking position or when you were just standing? A lot of the time, it's these little conscious acts that can have a real compounding effect over time. So the next time you go for a walk, just try to point your feet a little bit more forward so if you can roll a little bit more from the heel to the toe. So if you can sense the ground and almost push from the ground when you're going through a walking motion. If you wanna build on this, you can grab yourself a barefoot shoe, something that has a wide toe box that's gonna allow your foot and your arch to be a little bit more active. I started wearing barefoot shoes the better part of three or four years ago, and I'll say that my feet are significantly stronger from wearing shoes like these. The reason for that is these shoes don't really have much of a sole, so your foot and arch is almost forced to work in a more active way. A word to the wise is don't jump into wearing these for 10 to 12 hours a day. Could be doing more damage than good, so I would suggest wearing them for probably two to four hours after you go through some corrective exercises. So in conclusion, our feet are the primary contact points that interact with the ground and environment around us. So learning how to create proper ground tension and integration between these different joints will be imperative for our well-being and health long-term. That being said, when you start to look upstream into our rib cage and breathing mechanics, these become just as important factors. And you can find a video I did on that right here.